Hello, my darlings. All right. So we're going to go into detail about writing and self-publishing and hitting number one bestseller on Amazon with your nonfiction book so that you can truly position yourself as a leader. And this is even easier if you've already been producing content, like in a podcast, a blog, lots of social media content, especially if it's long copy, email marketing, lots of stuff. So keep on your hat around where you can repurpose content maybe courses and yeah, just all over the place. Lots of content. If you've been creating content, you can repurpose it into a book. Okay. So my name is Laura Peterson or laptop Laura on social media. And just a little heads up. There's no call to action on this. I'm not selling you anything. It's just pure content. Okay. So a little bit about me, if you haven't met me yet, uh, I was a big nerd in school. I totally believed the whole work as hard as you can in school, get as many A's as you can and go to the best college you can possible. And that will be life success, which was true in the eighties and nineties, but definitely not so true today necessarily. And I became a math and psychology teacher. So I taught AP psychology and honors algebra two at the high school level in Arizona, even though I'm from California. Then after teaching for about five years in 2011, I decided to take the full jump into entrepreneurship because it was something that I wanted to do for a really long time ever since I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, but I couldn't figure it out for a little while in my twenties. And so when I was 30 in 2011, I took the jump and, uh, started a business. Uh, the first thing that worked was a tutoring and test prep company with a business partner, but, um, my heart fell out of that pretty fast. Cause I just don't believe in that academic path for everyone anymore. Then in 2016, just after a couple of years of just doing side jobs and ghostwriting, content marketing or content creation for marketing companies and all this kind of stuff on the back end, I decided to start my own podcast. Oh, I also helped other people launch podcasts before I started my own. So my podcast copy that pops started in April of 2016. And that's all about writing tips and psychology hacks to apply to your writing, to do better with your business online. And then in 2021, just for fun, I started a diehard fan trivia podcast. Cause I think diehard is the best Christmas movie of all time. In the end of 2016, I had three people in one week say, why don't you write a book? And it was something I thought you only do like at the end of your career when you're really old <laughs> and I had to have a publishing deal from New York and all this kind of stuff. I just had all these different preconceived notions in my mind, but when three people said, no, you can self-publish and that's even better than publishing these days and you don't have to wait, just get going. I was like, okay, let me do that. So I wrote and self-published my first book, which is called How to Grow Your Podcast Brand and Business with Compelling Copy at the end of 2016. And I did it in 30 days. Kind of crazy. Uh, so I wrote, self-published, and figured out how to, how to hit number one bestseller in podcast and web, webcast category for the US and Canada. And then I did another book in 2018. I'm kind of forgetting. And I have like a million other books in my mind, but Lately, I've been just focusing more on clients and I have a new a little baby. And then I also decided to push myself out of my comfort zone because writing is a little bit of my superpower. So that doesn't scare me as much as speaking did. Used to be my absolute worst nightmare was to speak in front of other people, especially people I really looked up to and respected like Pat Flynn in the photo here. <laughs> but I decided to push through that and I've been making a lot of progress and have spoken now in like three continents and stuff. So fun stuff. And I totally feel you. If you feel like you're not super confident with a writing, push yourself and you can make progress and end up actually liking it. And so now these days I'm a huge Gary Vee nerd fan and I'm a new mom. So yeah, I can pretty much tell you all of Gary Vee's life story and was able to be on tea with Gary Vee with him, which was really cool in 2020. I think that was, and in his honor, that's why this presentation, no calls to action, just going to give you content. That's really valuable. Trying to give all my, give away all my best stuff for free. And if I'm missing something that you're having a question about, it's not intentional. So feel free to email me. 
uh, my email is laura at copy that pops.com, or you can find me on social media and ask, and I'm happy to help. Okay. So let's dive in. So right now I truly believe it's a golden age of self-publishing because the technology is there to support you. The platforms are there. Amazon's the biggest one in the space and it's never been easier. I'm not saying that it's no effort because like anything, it takes effort to get something done. Like if you start a podcast or really want to grow a social media channel, it's going to take work and effort, but it's definitely worth it. You do not need to wait around and have a publishing deal. In fact, I would argue against getting a publishing deal these days because they are not going to do all the marketing for you. A lot of people think they want a publishing deal because they think they'll just write the book, hand it over, and they'll, the publishing company will just get it into Oprah's hands and New York times bestseller. Like they're not going to do that. Why would they think about their limited resources? Why would they put a bunch of money behind an unknown author to blow up a book really big when they could go make a book deal with someone who already has a huge audience and keep more money because they're not spending it. So if you don't have a huge audience, which I'm guessing if you're watching this and you're looking into it, no, no offense. Like I'm the same way. I don't have a huge audience you don't, you're not going to get what you think you're going to get from a publishing deal, most likely. So ask around, if you're not convinced by what I just said, ask around for people who have had a publishing deal and really see. I've had, I've heard people like Gary Vee and Tim Ferriss and lots of others talk about maybe in future books, they just self-published because they already have huge audiences and they already have a huge marketing platform. So why not just keep all of the upside? So you keep all your royalties with self-publishing. You can go faster. So literally within 72 hours, you can have your book live on Amazon once you've got it written and you've got a cover design and everything. With publishers, it can take like 18 months. It's like, why? Why does it have to take that long? So it's super inexpensive. You can go really fast. You get all of the, you retain all the rights in all the decision-making. There are times with publishers that say, oh no, we don't like that you use this word on page 50. You have to change it. Or we don't like that cover. You need to go with this design or whatever. You have all the control if you do self-publishing. So all the control, all the money, all the everything, and you can go fast. Then the other thing is other than maybe having one of the top five publishers in New York, just for the brand name, what is the point of going with a publisher um, in terms of what you're going to get out of it? Because a book instantly raises your credibility. You can raise your prices. You can get more clients. You can give it away for free. Oh, we're going to talk about a lot of things you can do with a book, but you can do all that. Even if it's self-published, there's, there isn't the taboo anymore of self-publishing means crap, especially if it looks great. If you have a good cover, if you've done formatting and editing on the inside, you, you don't need it. So I just really challenge you to to rethink maybe preconceived notions about what it was in the past. So in this presentation, I'm just gonna give you a little overview visual so you can see what we're gonna cover. We're gonna jump into level one, which I call P1, two, and three, plan, pen, and polish the books, actually creating the book. Then in stage two, we're gonna talk about how to get a bestseller and what's the order of things that I recommend doing all of your publishing. So P4 is I recommend doing a publishing of just the Kindle version on Amazon first and get that proof of bestseller. So P5 is its own section because it's really fun to get it ranking number one in lots of categories. And then I recommend doing print and audio book if you decide to optional after the Kindle. So we'll get into that more, but that's why I break it out into this little stages. And then level three, the benefits, you actually will start getting all of these benefits even while you're writing the book. If you do what I recommend in P5, I have this little formula called track formula. We're going to talk about a attraction-based marketing, which includes sharing your journey throughout the process. Like Gary V talks about document, don't create. I really recommend to document your journey and just share the book writing process as you go. And you're going to start getting the benefits down in the level three. So I've had clients in the past that share they're writing a book and within weeks, people start reaching out to them and inviting them to go speak on their stage at an event just because they saw that they were taking action and, and trying to become an author. So some benefits, increased confidence that definitely worked for me. <laughs> Cause once I wrote out my book, I was like, Oh, I actually know a lot of stuff, more clarity. Again, if you write it all out, you're going to just see 
everything you know and everything you talk about most likely with clients and with in your podcast and your content, you're going to see in a really clear, organized way. And you get more clarity overall around what you know. You can raise your prices, you get instant credibility, make an impact, leave a legacy. We're going to talk about that more in P1, but like, why are you doing all this stuff? Why not put it into book form? Because book is historically has been something really difficult to do because of all the gatekeepers. So it has a lot of um, just inherent juice and power and esteem wrapped around it. So it's going to be, you know, helping people. And then also, gosh, imagine like your great, great grandchildren being able to read what you wrote now, even if it's about like a business topic, that'd be so cool. I wish I could read my great, great grandmother's writing about whatever she was up to in Italy or whatever. That'd be so cool new partnerships and brand awareness. So keep in mind too, that other people who put on events, oh, and that also P7 public speaking, podcast, public speaking and PR and media. Those are kind of like the core ones. And then the other ones are kind of ancillary that all come together. But just remember that people who are hosting podcasts, who want to book speakers, who want to put you on TV or in articles and stuff, they want to look credible. And so in order for them to look credible, their guests or the person they bring on needs to look credible. And having a book is just a key component to getting that done. Okay. So you might be like, really excited. Let's go. I want to dive in. But in the back of your mind, you might have imposter syndrome monster screaming at you things like, yeah, but you're not expert enough to write a book. Who are you to call yourself an author? Trust me, I've felt that, especially like around speaking, because that's where my comfort zone starts getting really pushed historically. But who is expert enough to do anything? If you're already talking about this stuff, I'm not saying to pretend and try to put yourself out there as something you're not, but if you already have a business around this, if you already have a brand around it, you're already talking about this all the time. How are you expert enough to share in blogs and podcasts, social media, but not to put it in a book form? Like that just doesn't make any sense to me. So put that out of your mind. That's just the imposter syndrome monster screaming in your ear. No one will buy your book. Oh, so embarrassing. <laughs> but honestly, even if two people buy your book, like your best friend and your mom, or your dad, you're still a published author. You can still get all the benefits from it. And if anyone is going to take the time to go look up your book and try to figure out how many sales that you've made and then make fun of you about it, they're most likely really hurting inside. And it's more issues around them than around you. So don't worry about that. Even if a book helps only one person that bought it, wouldn't that be worth it? I think so. It costs a lot to publish a book. So as you saw before, it's actually $0 to upload your book and publish it on Amazon. They only make money if you make money. So you don't have to pay anything up front if you want. So my first two books or my two books, uh, I paid $0. I think I, I might've paid like a hundred bucks to someone like a friend to go work on little things just to help me out, but nothing up front to Amazon. So you can't do it for $0 if you want. And then the imposter syndrome monster also might be saying, let's just embrace perfectionism and procrastination so we can't get hurt. A lot of people that I work with, they say that they've been thinking about writing a book for years and, or even when I start working with them, there's always like one more thing to add, one more thing to tweak, one more thing. And they're just pushing off and off and off. And it's really just the imposter syndrome monster saying that you're not good enough. So let's not try to get hurt and keep everything away from the public. But put it out there. It's going to find the right people. Okay. So diving really into the meat of it. P one is plan. So four questions for you to think about. And actually, I really recommend that you write out the answers for these and don't just keep it all in your head because it's going to give you more clarity as well. So the first question, which are like two questions kind of is what is your mission? And in other words, why do you do what you do? So why do you have a blog? Why do you have a podcast? Why do you post on social media? Why do you email people who have subscribed to your newsletter? Why are you doing it all anyway? Those reasons are the same reasons why you should do a book and something really great to keep in mind 
as you work on it so that you keep your momentum and your passion going through the ups and downs of the journey of writing the book. Same with number two. So who do you want to impact? Which maybe ties in a little bit too with number one, your mission might be to impact a certain subset of people, but really keep in mind who are those people you're doing all of this for? So when you're feeling the imposter syndrome monster yelling at you, or you're just getting overwhelmed by the process, which you probably will because it goes like this, <laughs> but it's worth it in the end. Keep in mind who you're really trying to make an impact for, and it's going to help you push through. Oops, clicked too many times. So number three and number four are all about what are you going to actually get out of the book for you and for the reader? So for you, have in mind, what are the things you want to achieve? Do you want to do more podcast interviews? And so you want to book more interviews by being an author? Do you want to get more speaking gigs? Do you want to actually charge to be a speaker? Do you want to raise your prices for the client work that you're doing? Think about all the reasons why a book is going to help you achieve those things. Actually write them out. And then number four, what is the reader going to get? Because I really don't believe in just putting out complete junk and nonsense, which you wouldn't do anyway, but really think about what is the purpose of the book? It'll also help you in your writing process as well. by really like just zoning in what's the problem you're going to solve? Who are you solving it for? And what is the transformation that the people are going to get as they read the book? And that could be emotional, psychological. It could be for entertainment, education, whatever the, the purpose is. Really think about what is the reader going to get by investing the time to sit down and read it from cover to cover. So in your planning stage, really think about all these questions, not just in your head, but really write it out. And it's going to help you start to get some more clarity on where you want to go with everything in your book. Okay. So once you were ready to sit down and write P2 is pen. I really, really recommend making a detailed outline in writing. So my method, I call the PST method because I'm from California and Pacific standard time. But in this case, the P stands for post-it notes. So I do love, you don't have to do it this way, putting out a bunch of post-it notes on my desk and just writing every possible idea on the post-it notes that I could ever write about, because you probably have a lot of ideas bouncing around your head. And you're like, what do I pick to put into my book? So for me, when I sat down to write my first book, I was like, I could write about psychology. I could write about writing tips. I could write about podcasting. So I'd helped people launch podcasts even before my own. I could write about being a teacher. I could write about world travel because I've been to like 44 countries. I could talk about a lot of things because we're all multifaceted people these days. And I wrote them all on sticky notes. And that really helped me because I was able to move it around and kind of start seeing patterns or groupings, or even see where things could overlap. So what I ended up doing with my first, so I was like, oh, I'm a nerd for copywriting and I'm a nerd for podcasting. How does that overlap? So I wrote a book for copywriting to help podcasters specifically. Something that I just figured out from the combination of writing out all my ideas on post-it notes. So in that first step for P, just get everything out of your brain. Don't edit it. Just let it all come on out. Then for step two, for the S, I call it the spider web mind map. So what I like to do is pick one topic or maybe two where they overlap, kind of like how I had it and say, okay, all these other sticky notes are amazing. So writing about world travel is amazing, but it's not going to be in this particular book. I can write it in a future book. So I put all the other sticky notes off to the side and say, these are future ideas I can do later. But right now, what am I going to work on? So I took copywriting and I took podcasting and I put it in the middle. And then I did another brainstorm kind of like a spider web out of all the different things that relate to that topic specifically. So show notes, episode description, title of the podcast, subtitle, of the podcast, the bio of my podcast authorship person, persona content for social media. There's a million different things from in there. And so in my spider web mind map, I brainstorm just on the core topic of what my book is going to be. Then once I've done that T timeline is my T in the PST method. So what I thought about there is like, okay, now I've got all these amazing topics and subtopics, but in what order is it logically going to make sense to teach my reader in the book? 
So I need to go from one chapter to the next. You can't just be like a big blob of, of ideas. Although actually that might be kind of a cool, unique artsy kind of way to present a book. But I thought, okay, what is the logical order that people can learn this topic? So I was like, well, let's start with the podcast show name and the show subtitle and then the episode titles and then the episode description. So I kind of try to make it in a logical order that someone might think it through, put that in order, that T that timeline becomes your detailed outline for your book. Now you can literally sit down and when you're ready to write it, you can jump around and go into any chapter and even write things out of order because you already have a full vision, a full roadmap roadmap of where you're going with your book. And then my tip two in here, or my step two is to think about what content you can repurpose if possible. So you might have done a great podcast episode on a topic that would fit perfectly in chapter four. Okay. Go to there. Maybe have it transcribed and stick it in there and edit it. So it, it reads nicely or, or summarize it, but there's probably a lot of content you've already created that can really work well into the different chapters that you're going to write. Uh, in terms of where you should write it, that's really up to you. And I, I have found over the years that there isn't any one perfect, I'm so in love with this application for writing, but I'll tell you what I do. So first of all, I like MacBooks, Macs. I don't like PCs and I hate Microsoft Word. I won't, I won't use it. Don't send me anything in Microsoft Word. So what I per- personally do is I do all my initial writing, especially if I'm working with clients, because it's so much easier to collaborate without sending attachments back and forth is I do it in Google docs. So I'm a huge fan of Google docs. You can work on things simultaneously with yourself and an editor or a business partner or a friend or whatever, who's maybe reading and giving you feedback and it's all online. So you can work on it from any computer anywhere in the world. You don't have to worry about which file is the most updated one. So Google docs, huge fan of that but I have found it's not robust enough to export the file in the file formats that Kindle needs and make it look exactly how you want it to look. So I don't stress about making everything little, every detail perfect in the Google Docs, Google Drive stage. Once I've got how I want in general, then I will usually do my final editing in something called Scrivener, or I just write directly into Scrivener if it's my own book. I'm kind of also mixing with I work with clients. I don't have them work in Scrivener. We start in Google Docs. Uh, but Scrivener is spelled S-C-R-I-V-E-N-E-R. Sorry, I don't have this written down on here. And maybe I do on a future slide, but um, it is designed specifically for book writers. So it's got a bit of a learning curve. Their tech support isn't always the best. So if you're not planning to write a lot of books or you just really don't want to learn something brand new, I would recommend writing it in Google Docs and then maybe paying someone on Fiverr or Upwork to do the formatting for you. Um, There's also other platforms always popping up all the time. Even Amazon Kindle itself has got Kindle Create, something where you can do the formatting for Kindle through them for free. Maybe it doesn't look exactly how you want. Maybe not as dynamic as some of these other platforms, but it's out there. So something to consider. In terms of how long should it be? People ask me a lot, how long should my book be? And my short answer is as long as it needs to be, (laughs) as long as it needs to be in order to achieve your goals for yourself and for your uh, reader. But that's kind of glib. And um, to be a little bit more specific, I can tell you that you need your book to be at least 24 pages in order to do the physical print on demand with Amazon. So we can say that as a minimum 24 pages, then you need the book to be hundred pages. If you want to have writing on the spine and make it look good on the spine. So let me see the only book I've got handy right here is a fiction book, Robert Ludlum, but this is more than hundred pages. So it's going to be really nice and legible and you can have stuff on the spine. If it's smaller than that, then it gets too small for them to print and make it look really good. So they don't like you to have anything on the spine. If it's under a hundred pages in terms of it being too big, my first book is about 360 pages. And I can tell you, I am not interested after trial and error of bringing that to conferences and giving it away as gifts because it's so dang heavy. So I'd also recommend don't make it too big because it's too heavy and you can't carry it all around. And then also arguably let's narrow this in so that you're 
uh, book really focuses on solving one core problem for your audience. You can always, you've got a kind of like a big book, turn it into like a three book series, three part series. Then it's even better. Now you have three books published. So if you had to twist my arm to force me to give you a number, I'd say if you shoot for like 150 to 170 pages, that gives us over a hundred pages for the spine. And it like feels like a book it has that thud factor. Like if you drop it on the desk, you hear it goes boom and doesn't feel super, super thin. So that's a little guideline you could go for. And the most common file size or dimensions is six by nine inches. Okay. So pen, uh, still includes also in my designing of this P method thing is doing the cover design. So we also still need to have the book cover and like it or not, people do judge a book by its cover. So you really need to make sure that it looks good. So what I love to do is a cover design contest. So as an example, uh, on the left here, on this side of the screen, I went to Fiverr and I hired three different designers. I gave them the same design brief of kind of what I had a vision for, for the book. And I paid them 42 to $31 each. And these are the three designs I got. So I basically paid $110 and I got three book designs from three different people. And I put it on social media and I asked people to vote, which ones, which one do you like the best? And we ended up going with number three based off of, um, voting and my thinking things through. And I kind of started wanting to focus on red more. I just like the color red. Then I did another book design contest, um, with 99 designs. And this is a book as a time recording, I haven't actually published it yet, but I'm planning to something called book that pops. So I did a 99 designs contest and I'm in love with 99 designs. Now that's what I recommend to everybody and always do for clients. It's $299. Um, so it's a little bit more expensive, but you end up getting designs from potentially over like a hundred designers or at least over hundred designs. Some designers do more than one. So anyway, uh, for this one, here's an example of a post that I did with four different design options and asked people to vote. Now, the interesting thing is, and why I really recommend that you do a contest like this is you're going to get feedback that you never would have considered. So I had a lot of people for B2 right here, this one, this yellow one, tell me that they thought that that said at fast glance, book that poops. Did not even consider that. But once I saw it, I couldn't unsee it. And I was like, oh no, I definitely got to get that changed. So you're going to get such incredible feedback from people uh, if you ask them to vote. Also, my posts like this are the number one most engaged posts I've ever made on social media. Nothing else comes close to it. People just love sharing their thoughts on something fast and easy and visual. So make it easy for people to say which one they like. Also put all the books in one image so, you could, so people can look at them and compare. Uh, something that I've, I've seen people do in the past, which I feel is a mistake, is they'll upload, let's say like five designs and they're all individual photos like on Facebook and people have to click through them and then they can't compare visually. So put it all in one and it's a great way for people to vote. So like I said, I ended up picking number three for that one. And then I ended up working with a designer where it looked like book that poops, but we did some edits and came up with this version instead. And I, I really like that, like how it focuses on the, um, on the words. Okay. So now we're into P3 polish. So for editing, you can use the Grammarly plugin and catch a lot of errors just as a heads up. I don't agree with all of the grammatical suggestions that they make. It's not always right. Or there are different choices of style. So just know that what they recommend is for correcting is not necessarily a thousand percent correct, but it can be great to help you catch little different things. You can also ask a nerdy friend for free to help you edit your book. My best friend from high school edited my first book for free. Thank you, Emily. Uh, then you can also go to fiverr.com, guru.com, upwork.com, places like that. And you can find people for a really reasonable, pre reasonable price to edit, uh, proofread your book. And you can go from just proofreading, trying to catch little errors all the way up to 
developmental editing where people are actually saying, okay, this paragraph doesn't make sense. Let's put it in chapter five and move things all around. So the price is going to depend also on, on how much help you need for the editing part. In terms of formatting for your actual manuscript, you'll, for Kindle, you need it in the file type EPUB and for print, you export it as a PDF and Amazon does take other file types, but these are the ones I find to be the best for the purpose. And then for print, my favorite dimensions are six inches by nine inches, uh, but 5.5 by 8.5 also looks uh, about the same really is up to you. If you want just to figure out what's best for you, literally look at your bookshelf, pull it out, measure it and see which book that you like the feel of it and the size of it to, to go with. Um, you can also do more like creative dimensions, but not all things are uh, supported in Amazon's print on demand. So you can check that out on Amazon and see what file sizes they currently support for print on demand, if you're wondering. And if you have trouble finding it, just send me an email and I'll help you find it. For the cover, your Kindle, you only need the front image and you're going to upload that as a JPEG. And then for print, you're going to have the front, the spine, and the back all in one PDF file. Uh, you also want bleed. So whoever does the design, make sure that they allow for a little extra color around the edges, because when it goes to print, they're going to cut it around from like their printer. And they don't want to cut any of your design off and like have like a weird white thing off to the side. So make sure there it has some bleed in the design. Okay. So for P4 is publishing Kindle. I highly recommend to start with Kindle first one, because it's easier to hit number one bestseller in lots of categories for Kindle. You can also reduce the price of the Kindle a lot lower than you can for print. And it's also a good idea to just give people one thing to decide when they go to Amazon. You don't want them to be like, should I get the hardcover or the paperback or the audio or the Kindle? The more choices they have, the more like they're going to get distracted and go do something else. So just give them one choice. I recommend Kindle. So go to kdp.amazon.com right here, this website, and it looks like this. And if you don't have an account yet, you can just sign up for one and you'll just use or hit sign in. You'll use the same login and password you already have for your main Amazon account. If you already have a main Amazon account, it's free to start this. So go for it. Once you're inside, you'll see something like this. So bookshelf is where it's going to list all your books. This page that you see is the bookshelf. Your books will be under that when you scroll. Once you've got books published, reports will give you some data about how many people have bought, which books and from which countries. Uh, those are the main two sections you'll spend most of your time. For creating a new book, it's literally right here. When you log in on the bookshelf, you just hit this button for start a Kindle book, start a paperback, and brand new as of the end of 2021 is hardcover. You used to have to go through a third party in order to do that, but Amazon's starting to support that. So that's really exciting. Then for Kindle, since we're on that step, if you hit plus, let's publish a Kindle, you're going to see three tabs of information that you have to put in, in order to make your book live and get it live on Amazon. So in the first tab, it's going to be the main core content um, like description stuff of your book. So the title, your author name, the description of your book, that's going to show up on your product page, the categories that you'll pick, but we're going to get into more on that because if you just go with Amazon stuff, you're going to miss out on huge opportunities, but that's where you're going to pick your categories at least for step one. Um, yeah. So this is just like the basic overall book details about your book. Oops. I thought I clicked and it would show more, but no. So on the second tab, if you clicked on that, it would show you a little bit, something different. That's where you actually upload your files. So you upload your manuscript doc, um, doc if, if for, for this, it'd be an EPUB type file. And then also your image for the front JPEG version of your book cover. And then on the third tab is where you set the pricing. You can have different prices for different countries and Amazon has its own URL, unique Amazon um, front page for like 10 ish different countries, Mexico, Canada, UK, Australia, Japan, Brazil. Maybe there's more than that. Oh, 
my little monkey got back from the park. So that is an overview of publishing for Kindle. Then once you've got all of your information filled out on these three tabs, you just hit publish and within 72 hours, it will be live on Amazon. It usually happens faster every once in a while. If Amazon's really behind on things, it could take longer, but that's a really good guideline about 72 hours and it's completely free. They don't make money unless you do. Okay. So once your book is live, it'll look something like this. So this is back on the bookshelf. If you scroll down, you'll see your books. And if you hover over view on Amazon, you can open up these links out to the different countries where you can find your book in those specific countries as well. And then these little three dots, when you click on that, uh, well, the, this is later for the print book, but, uh, once you have the print book up, you can, from there, order proof copies. So you can get a proof copy in the mail before it's live and actually hold it in your hand and see if it looks right. Or you can also order author copies where you can just purchase copies of your book for the print cost, um, plus shipping. So you don't have to pay the retail cost, which is really cool. So let's get into the best seller stuff, which is really fun. What I'm going to teach you is about how to hit number one in lots of subcategories. So not necessarily number one of all of Amazon, uh, unless you have a really big audience, then you could do it. But most people I work with don't have ginormous audiences or huge, huge marketing budgets, but they can still hit number one in really relevant categories. And you can actually do it in up to 10 categories. Plus if you do really well, you can start hitting number one in the parent categories where it gets more and more competitive. So I've had clients who hit number one in like 16 categories on their launch day, which is really, really fun. All right. So the first thing is that you need to know is the one hour rule. So unlike things like New York times bestseller, wall street journal bestseller, Amazon doesn't have to sit around and wait for book retailers to send them data about sell sales at local retail shops. They've got all their information right there online. And so they actually update their rankings every hour, not perfectly on the hour. Sometimes it takes, there's a little bit of a lag, but overall it's about every hour they are updating who's number one, who's number two and, and beyond. So they want to give the most relevant information to their users as possible. So they keep it really updated and fresh. And the number one thing that they count for bestseller is the number of sales. <laughs> so in short, if you can drive a lot of sales into a short period of time frame, you can hit number one really quickly in categories, especially those that aren't as competitive as others. So we're going to talk about that a little bit more as we go through this track formula. This is my little fun way of breaking down the process of getting number one bestseller in lots of categories and make it kind of easy to wrap your head around. So the T stands for timing and pricing strategy. So I really recommend that you launch your book on a Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday, Monday. You could also as well. It's not my favorite, but you could. And that's just because there's going to be most people online paying attention that you can ask to go and buy your book. Don't do a Friday or a weekend because people are going to be checked out. If it's in the summer, they're going to be heading to the beach, you know, driving to visit family on that note. Don't do it on or too close to big holidays. So you don't really want to do it Thanksgiving week, especially if you're in the U S you don't want to do it too close to Christmas because people already checked out or even on their vacations. So think about Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or Monday. And when it's not around any other big major holiday, that's going to take people away from their computers or away from paying attention to what's going on with your book. Uh, pricing strategy. I recommend doing the Kindle for just 99 cents, just for one day for your public launch day. So you can see Allison Melody, which is a good friend, podcast buddy of mine. I helped her with her book, Food Heals. And this is her book on launch day, or maybe even the following day, because she actually we had a little issue with Amazon really lagging its results. So she didn't hit number one, if I recall, until like late, late at night on the day that we launched. So we might've kept it 99 cents the, the, the next day too, just because things were kind of slow with, with Amazon's updating, but she got a little best seller flag number one in holistic medicine, which was super relevant to her book and really, really exciting. She got number one, in lots of other categories too, but that's just a screenshot to show you what it might look like. Okay. So 99 cents on a weekday, 
and uh, also in terms of timing strategy. Remember how Amazon can take up to 72 hours or more every once in a while to make your book live. So if you're going to launch, let's say this coming Tuesday, you don't want to hit publish on Tuesday morning because it might not actually be live. Most likely won't be live when you're trying to drive all this traffic that you've been telling people about, Hey, go buy my book on Tuesday. You don't want it to not actually be live. And then it shows up on Thursday and then everyone's like, well, you told me two days ago. So if you're going to launch on a Tuesday public launch, you actually want to get your book uploaded the week before. So I'd say by like Thursday, Friday, make sure you get your book uploaded, all everything, all the T's crossed and I's dotted in there, hit publish so that there's enough time for it to go live on Amazon. So your book will actually be physically live on Amazon before your public launch day. But we need to do this to build in enough time to make sure everything works out. Then there's another step that we're going to talk about when we get to see categories is you're going to need to reach out to tech support to get those categories you actually want. That's a super book life hack. And that also will take up to 72 hours for them to process, but you can't request categories from tech support until you've already made one sale. So here's kind of the whole process. You need the book live so you can get one sale. That could be you or your spouse, or your mom. Once the one sale has processed, then you can request the categories that you actually want from tech support. Because once you get one sale, then the categories start showing up on your product page. There's no categories that show up on your product page until you get at least one sale. Once that shows up, then tech support will help you out and get you in the ones that you want. That will take up to 72 hours too. So we want all of these things to be perfect before we actually drive our traffic to buy the book. That's why if you're going to launch on like a Tuesday or Wednesday, get the book live on Amazon the week before. So you have time to build that out. Okay. So just a bit of strategy I've learned over the years of doing all this. Okay. R stands for reviews. So having more reviews is not going to necessarily raise your ranks in the bestsellers list. I mean, the exact full agro agro, agro algorithm that they use is not shared, but um, they do base it mostly on pricing or I'm sorry, on sales from my experience, but reviews will still help you because as you have more reviews, that's going to be more social proof. So more people are going to be likely to buy your book. If they see that other people have reviewed it and liked it as well, this goes for complete strangers that are going to start seeing your book. As you start rising in the rankings, you're going to start seeing, getting more organic traffic to people who have never heard of you before. So it's going to make a big impact with them, but it actually makes a big impact too with your friends and family who sometimes it's like twisting people's arms to get them to go and do anything to help you out. But if they see a lot of reviews, they're going to be like, damn, okay. Like she's working it. I'm going to support her. Anyway, social proof. We're social animals. It's a psychology, get reviews up ASAP so that it will help with getting more snowball effect. Uh, in order to get reviews on your launch day, you're like, how do I do that? What I recommend you do is form a launch team, which is a fancy word, fancy phrase of saying, ask people in advance to be willing to leave a review on your launch day. Now you cannot ask for them to leave a five-star review. You can just ask them to leave an honest review. And what I like to do is send out a PDF copy via email to the people who agreed to be on my launch team a week or two weeks before the public launch that they have time to actually read it and go through it. And then on launch day, say, please go and buy it for just 99 cents if you're willing to, because then it'll be Amazon verified review and leave me an honest review. It it really helped me out. Most people are willing to do that, you know, willing to spend a buck to support you. Um, They can also leave a review, even if they don't purchase it, it just won't be an Amazon verified review. So it won't look quite as great, but it's still better than nothing. Okay. So ask people in advance if they want to get an early copy of your book, help you out, be ready to go and leave a review on your launch day. And that's how you can get review, a lot of reviews. If you're looking for how many should I have, there's no perfect should more the better, but if you can get double digits, like at least 10, I think that really is a nice psychological, um, threshold to, to start with if you can. Oh, also heads up reviews sometimes take a couple of days for them to show up. So 
just be warned. That's how it goes. All right. A attraction-based marketing, which I alluded to earlier is all about, you know, if you don't have a huge budget to promote your book and try to drive sales with paid ads, which don't often work anyway. So let's say run Facebook ads and you have to get someone from Facebook over to Amazon if you want them to buy it on Amazon. So it helps you with a bestseller ranking. It's a lot of steps in between you can lose people. So I really recommend focus on the attraction-based marketing stuff. Use psychology to pull people into your journey and want to actually be a part of it and see it succeed. So things like asking for feedback on the title, asking for people to vote on the subtitle and feedback on that, the voting on the cover, anything visual and easy for them to vote on just goes bananas. Amazing. Um, ask people if they want to look at the first chapter and give you feedback. Not everyone will, but those who do are raising their hand and saying, I'm a big fan and I'm a big supporter. I want to help be a part of your journey. So lots of things to pull people into the journey instead of like, Hey, go buy my book. I just popped out of this cave and now I've got a book. Go support me. No one's interested in that. Pull them into the journey along the way and even be vulnerable and share with them. Like I'm super intimidated. Who am I to call myself an author? Share the imposter syndrome monster stuff that's going on in the head, in your head. Just be real with people. And they're going to be like, wow, like I feel that way too. Or I felt like that before. Keep going. I support you. 99% of the people are going to be really supportive and you're going to just feel all this amazing love pour out by your taking action to do something worthwhile. Okay. So back to categories, when you log into your KDP on that first tab, you're going to scroll down and you're going to be able to pick two categories. Those two categories that you're able to pick don't look identical to the research that you're going to do out live on Amazon. And it's going to drive you crazy and make you really confused. And then to top it all off, once your book is live and you get one sale, your product page is going to throw, show up to three categories. Those three categories are just me like randomly generated by Amazon's algorithm machine bots or whatever, based on the two categories that you picked. So you kind of pick kind of two general things and then they put you into three. Most of the time, those are super competitive categories that you don't want. So most authors just do that and say, oh, well, it is what it is. I'm going up against Oprah. I'll never hit number one. But what we know is, and you know now, is you can actually scour through Amazon, all its categories and look through all the little branches. And I'll show you an example in a minute. Find up to 10 Kindle categories that you want. And then as soon as your book is live and showing the the categories on your product page, because you got one sale, you can send a note to tech support with the exact 10 categories you want and say, put me in those and you can get them on the phone and make sure they put you in the 10 that you want. I recommend doing both. I like to send it in via the, they have like a little email send out thing in there. Um, like you click the contact tech support, whatever, send it in and then wait a few hours or overnight or whatever, and then call them and say, Hey, did you get this? I want you to make sure you push it through and double check with them. Uh, if someone doesn't understand or isn't very helpful, hang up, call back and get someone else who will. Cause I've had people who have no idea what's going on with the Kindle categories for tech support, but you can't absolutely do it. I do it every time for my clients and for my books. Okay. Uh, keywords. Uh, those are also, you can pick up to seven on that first tab of the information. So uh, you do some research in Google with their free keywords tool to get some ideas on what's trending around your topic. Um, there's also some plugins and, and, and apps and things that can help you with specifically with Amazon. I'm going to tell you about two of them, I think on the next slide. Uh, okay. Maybe not on this slide. So hold on. I'll, I'll get there. Uh, but just as a little overall best advice, Remember to do 99 cents with just the Kindle only. Cause like with your print book, you're not going to be able to, let's say your book is 150 pages. You're not going to be able to price that lower than like, let's say eight or $9 to cover printing costs, Amazon's royalties. So it's going to be just a harder ask be like, Hey, grandma, will you go buy this $10 book? That's about something you're not really caring about. She's probably really, I don't really want this in my house. And it's like killing trees but I'm willing to support you for a dollar and just go get your Kindle version to help you with bestseller. You're going to do one big push for sales, but remember to share the journey from the get-go research, 10 Kindle categories 
And the way to find, oh, that's what I didn't tell you yet is the way to find great categories is you want to find subcategories where the book currently, and you're going to do this research the week before your launch, not like five months before, because remember this is changing all the time. So around that weekend before your launch, you could even do it is you want to find categories where the current book that's in the number one position in that subcategory is about 20,000 or higher overall in all of Kindle. That is an indication that that subcategory is not super competitive. I'm going to show you an example on a future slide. Let me see. Okay, cool. So as an example, when I did this, built out this little presentation, the number one book in podcasting and webcasting was this book called stop asking questions. So what I did is I, you literally look through all of these categories over here, all these little sub ones, like go to Kindle eBooks, open it up and just like go on a scavenger hunt down in all these little subcategories and find the ones that are relevant to your book. So my first book, it would have been relevant for podcasting and webcasting. So I click on that and I'd see what's the number one book. And then I click on this book and look at its product page. And when you scroll down, it shows you product details and it'll show you that the book is currently number one in podcasting and webcasting, podcasts and webcasts. And overall it's around 17,000 in all of Kindle. So this is a pretty good one. I would definitely go for this. Like you can do it with, let's say 30, 35, 40, 45 sales. If you drive like 40 sales, you're going to for sure be number one in this category. Um, and if you remember my first book hit number one in podcasts and webcasts, this podcasting and webcasting didn't even exist back then. So the categories are always, um, changing and updating. They're adding new ones and adjusting stuff. So it's important to do your research just before, not like too early in advance. Um, just to kind of talk this out again, if this number right here is really low, that means it's super competitive. So like if Oprah publishes a book, it's probably gonna be like number two in all of Kindle. So if she's number two in all of Kindle and number one in whatever these categories are, don't even bother with these. You're never going to beat her. If this number is like 90,000, which I have had a client before where there's like 95,000, you're going to hit it with just a couple of sales. Like it's going to be so fast and crazy. So hopefully that helps explain. If you um, have more follow-up questions, definitely send me a note. So uh, that's the category a little secret hack right there. The next tip is make the book live a week before your public launch so that you can get tech support to put you in the 10 categories and all the stuff we talked about. Then also on your launch date, be ready to grab screenshots of your number ones in all the subcategories and parent categories, check the other countries, look out for the flag. It's historically for my clients, it's been faster to get a number one new release flag and to rank number one in the new release categories. Um, but it doesn't always come with that little bestseller flag, like you saw with Allison's book, but look out for it. Take a screenshot. You're not going to get an email for Amazon saying, congrats. You're not going to get a little plaque in the mail. Nothing. You got to take screenshots for your own proof. Okay. So just to give you a little bit more encouragement, like this is not just crazy nerdy Laura Peterson doing this. Um, I wanted to share two quick stories just about, um, or examples of Tamina Watson and Laura powers. And so they were in a group program that I ran, um, where we did, we had like a group of like oh, 20 authors or so new authors. And we did the whole process in like 10 to 14 weeks. I don't know. I can't remember. I've done a lot of different like variations of that, but Tamina did her book design contest with 99 designs and it just came out looking amazing. So this is her book and she definitely hit number one in lots of categories. And then Laura powers. I don't think she did her book. I can't remember how she did the book design. She might have done it herself or maybe from her friend, but she absolutely hit number one podcasting and webcasting, which is super relevant to her book by just following the steps that I just showed you guys. So definitely, definitely possible. You can do it too. Okay. Here are some helpful tools that I alluded to a moment ago, Katie spy is $59 one time. And this is my affiliate link. If you 
want to use it. If you don't, you can go Google Katie Spy and find that, or it might just be katiespy.com. I'm not sure. And Publisher Rocket, which is $97 one time. I have both of these and I really recommend them. They just help you figure out more detailed information specifically from Amazon around keywords, categories, what books are currently doing well, what are like trending words that are appearing in titles of books that are in the top 10, top 20 books. So just extra tools of the trade. If you want to go even more in depth and get more insights for your own book as well. P six for print and audio. I recommend taking a couple week break after you do your Kindle book and then do the print. So paperback. And I recommend a little break because the file format for your print is going to be different than Kindle with Kindle. Your book is not going to have set page numbers. It's not gonna have a running header. None of that kind of traditional stuff that you see inside of a book because like this book ends right here with this word on this page, but it's not going to show up like that on every single person's Kindle device. So the Kindle file is going to actually just adjust and flow depending on the screen size of the person reading the book. So the formatting is going to be different from Kindle versus paperback. So to not overwhelm yourself, I recommend just really focus on the Kindle, get that live, get the bestseller, have fun, and then take a breather and make sure everything's perfect and ready to go for your paperback. Also, it's going to take a bit of time for you to order the proof copy, actually get it in the mail, look through it, make sure there's anything, any little tweaks you need to make to the file, re-upload the file and say, we're good to go. So give yourself a buffer. You can't do Amazon prime and get your book in like the same day or the next day. It's, it takes like five to seven to 10 days sometimes for you to actually have it printed and sent to you. So be forewarned. You're just going to build on a little bit of time. Plus give your audience, you know, a couple of week break from hearing about promotions and stuff. And they'll be more excited to hear you do another big push. If you want to do another marketing push for your paperback hardcover, I've never full disclosure done it through KDP, but it's now in beta mode and it able to start doing that. So check that out. That's really cool. If you want to, and then the audiobook, if you want to do audiobook, you go through acx.com. That's where that's the main site for processing everything, uploading your files. You can, um, also get someone to do voiceover for it by either paying them up front or agreeing to a royalty split on your audiobook sales. And exactly how to do everything is all through ACX. So I'm not going to go into super details on it here. Go to there for the most up-to-date information. Okay. So I went a little bit fast because I want to give you a nice full overview, but truly did try to give good details. So reach out if you've got more questions and to give you a little bit more encouragement, here's Valerie Morris. She is the one of the person I referenced earlier where a book wasn't even out yet. And someone booked her for a speaking gig. Um, so share your journey. A lot of my past clients and students have been really reluctant to share their process along the way. Cause they're just like, Oh no, I just need to go into my cave and then appear with a book, but don't do that. Traction based marketing, really share it as you go. Uh, Saba Ali, she has used her book to get on live TV, like three times. She's done two Ted talks. Now she's spoken on stage all over the place. Like she's leveraged it so amazingly. You can do book signings. So Wendy Kim, Kim did one. Um, I forgot where she did it, but somewhere locally, she did a book signing and Jimmy Colson did it actually in a Barnes and Noble. So after all the COVID stuff and the world is normal again, you can do a book signing with Barnes and Noble. All you have to do is just publish your book through Barnes and Noble, their website or their e-version even. And there's just a couple of steps, but you're completely able to for free do a, have a booth and do a book signing inside of Barnes and Noble, which is super cool. So my last little bonus thing I want to throw out there is seven ways to sell more books because people often ask, how do I sell more books? Now, I truly believe that a, a book can help you grow your brand and business in so many ways and, and be a positive ROI in all those other ways that we've talked about. So even if you don't make a lot of sales, it's very still worth the effort. But if you want to think about how to actually make more sales and get the book in front of more people. Amazon itself, you can do ads and actually show ads to people who are already in the mindset to buy a book. You can also do something called Kindle Unlimited. So if you agree with your Kindle book to only make it the book available on Amazon, that's it. You can't sell it on your website. You can't sell it on bondsandnoble.com. You can't sell it on any of the other ones. 
you're allowed to then do things like a free promo for up to five days for 90, up to five days out of 90 days. You can make your book free for people who have Kindle Unlimited. You can do countdown deals where it's like 99 cents for 24 hours and 199, then 299, and it goes back up. And um, I do usually recommend having your book at least like 299 for Kindle. That's where you can get a higher percentage of royalties. I didn't mention that before, but any price under 299 for Kindle, you get 35% royalty. And if it's 299 or higher, then you get 70% royalty. So for the launch, I don't care about royalties. I just want to make it easy for people to buy lots of books to get my number one bestseller. So I do 99 cents, but then afterwards, I usually bump it up to at least 299 so that I get a higher royalty. And it just like, feels like maybe more psychologically valuable by being a higher price. You can also make money off of KENP, which stands for Kindle edition normalized pages. So that's basically how many pages are people actually reading in the Kindle book. And you'll make a portion of a global fund that Amazon pools for Kindle unlimited books. That's another way that you can make money even beyond sales. If people are actually reading your book a lot and you're in this program, you can make money just off of that too. Uh, something else to check out is BookBub. So you can do ads and feature deals with them. Um, they're often difficult to get in, but from the, and I've never done it, but from the people I've talked to who have, they say like, it can just drive tons of sales. So that could be a really good one to check out and see if you can make it work. Facebook kind of mentioned that before you can do ads. You can also be really active in groups that are niche specific. So if you're writing a book on real estate, helping realtors, then be in real estate, realtor groups, uh, or there's also groups that are all around book promotion. So you're actually able to promote like a free book deal or 99 cent on Kindle book deal, things like that. So you can check out different groups on Facebook. That's another way to, to do it, especially like organic. Uh, number four is make your book available off Amazon. If you don't want to do the Kindle unlimited. So Barnes and Noble, smash words, Goodreads, iBooks, Kobo, things like that are other places just to get more distribution for your book. Number five, share value to drive interest. So TikTok and LinkedIn at the time of recording this, the end of 2021 is gives you the most organic reach. So I really recommend in those, uh, you could also do a podcast book tour. So once your book is live, you could try to book a bunch of podcasts to share your expertise and valuable tips and tricks to the audience and mention that you've got a book and how people can find it. Um, just remember you really need to add value. If it's just promoting your book and it feels like an ad, people are just going to tune you out and not care. So make sure you're really sharing value and, and people will want to go and check out your book too. You could also even run a contest. So you could do something where like, um, if people share your book post or do something with you, engaging you on social media, then they, you're going to randomly pick someone to win a physical, maybe you sign a copy and send it to them. And then maybe there's like five runners up who get a KDP version because you can actually buy a KDP version and, and email it like as a gift or just the PDF version. If you don't want to send the KDP, um, file type thing through Amazon, you could also reach out to other people in your niche if they have books or other products and kind of do like a bundle. So people, the top prize could win like a course to your friend's class and your book and something else and make it as a part of like a little bundle. So think about fun ways that you can engage your community, running a contest and making your book part of the prize. Number six, uh, make it very easy to buy on your website, social media profiles, email signature, et cetera. So if it's only on Amazon, then make sure there's a link directly to your Amazon. If it's on your website, then make it really, really easy to find and make the purchase, especially if it's not a super high cost item. Some people who maybe aren't ready to hire you buy your other products and services might be willing to spend two bucks, 10 bucks, 15 bucks, whatever the prices are for the different types of formats to learn the knowledge from you and kind of start, um, testing the waters and seeing if you're going to be a good fit for them. And then a bonus fun idea to start thinking about is to make your book an NFT or to give away an NFT as a prize. Okay. So this might be like, why are you talking about NFT stands for non-fungible token? We're getting into like the crypto web three blockchain world. Um, I did a podcast episode on this. It's episode 216 of my copy that pop show. 
uh, where Gary V sold about 1.2 million books in 24 hours because of the power of NFTs and the excitement all around that. So anyway, that's a little cliffhanger. Go check out the podcast and check out what Gary V did and see if that's something that could work for you. All right. So quick little overview and final tips on how to get started. So we looked at P1, 2, and 3 around getting the book done and then doing the bestseller and what order we should do things to get our number one bestseller and get people to buy our book and be excited about uh, joining our journey. And we alluded to the different benefits and things for podcasts, public speaking, PR, media, and all the other ancillary things. Excuse me. So quick tips on how to get started. Number one, is I recommend to pick a Kindle public launch date. And I recommend to make it 30 to 90 days out. Uh, A lot of people will say you need at least two years to write a great book, but that's not true. Um, Tasks expand or attract to fit the time that you allot them. And I find anything that's more than three months away, you will just procrastinate and find reasons not to actually get your butt in gear and making it happen. So I recommend a date 30 to 90 days out. Then number two is share that date over and over and over and over and over and over on social media, on your podcast, on your blog, wherever you've got your sharing content, because you are more likely to let your own self down, your own goals down than you are to let others down. So that public accountability is going to be like, no other motivator. You're going to make it happen. If you're actually sharing publicly that date, plus people are going to start getting excited and like, see it getting closer and closer. Number three, block out time on your calendar for writing, make it a priority. So when I did both of my books in 30 days, (laughs) I did it first thing in the morning. So I woke up early and I didn't open my computer. I didn't check my phone. I just sat down and worked on my book so that I had full energy and didn't let other people's fires become my priorities. I made my book, my priority. So block it out on your calendar. Then number four is just get started with P1, start making a plan, start thinking about how you want the book to benefit yourself and your reader and why you're doing all this so that you're going to feel that excitement and push through the, the tough times that might come a long way on the journey. Cause we all go like this. It's normal. And then number five is to share your progress on social media your podcast, your blog, everywhere. Remember attraction-based marketing, share the journey. Think of yourself as like a documentarian, like recording your journey. Think of how freaking cool that would be for your great, great grandkids to watch the journey of you writing a book, like for no other reason, if no one buys it, that's cool. So those are my tips for getting started. Ultimately, if you've been thinking about this, it's your turn. You don't need a publishing deal. Let's go. If you've got any questions, please email me, laura at copythepubs.com, or you can find me in social media at Laptop Laura. I hope this has been really, really helpful and inspiring and just the tip of the iceberg. So get going. You can do it. And let me know when your book is live. I'll go buy it for 99 cents if you hit me up. <laughs> All right. Bye.